Amen. Let's open up our Bibles, please, to Proverbs 29. Proverbs. <coughs> chapter 29. And we're going to go to, you guessed it, verse 18. The Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening, Lord. Thank you for this chance for us to come together here on Sunday to learn more about thee and that word. And Father, I just ask that you fill us with the Holy Ghost so that you'll be able to illuminate us and inspire us to live for you this evening, Lord. And Father, I just ask you to take me out of the way so you can give this message in a way that is in accordance with your will, Lord, uh, and to your glory. And we give you thanks, Father, for all things, especially for the salvation you've brought through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as you can see here, that if we don't have any vision, we're not going to do so well. Okay. And I think that's something to consider in this new year as we're approaching 2020, aren't we? And so the title of this message is Seeing 2020. Because I'm hoping that I can help us this evening get a little bit more clarity on what that really means for us as Christians here this evening. So if you would, go to Exodus 30. Exodus 30. Why would I go there? That's a good question. Exodus 30. I'm going to go to verse 11. The Bible says... And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty geras. You see that? We're trying to see twenty twenty this evening. And half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Everyone that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. There it is again. The rich shall give no more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your soul. So we see that 20 doesn't change no matter who you are. Rich, poor, black, white, yellow, black, green, purple, doesn't matter. It's what you give. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. That's interesting. That it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And I think we need to see 2020 because we need to recognize what 20 means in the Bible. What does it represent? Because if we can figure out what 20 represents, maybe we'll know how we should see 2020, don't you think? And if you noticed here, it was tied to the ransom for the souls of the people, see? It was tied to their atonement. So I happen to believe that 20 is the number for redemption in the Holy Scriptures, see? And so you see that these geras or these little sum of money that they're receiving for each person, it's taken and it's to be put into the service of the tabernacle of the congregation for the people. And so you see, the Lord says he has a purpose to this. He's not just collecting money for no reason because he wants to pocket it. He plans to redistribute it and use it to his glory and to take care of this ransom. And so maybe we need to look at the tabernacle a little. Go to Exodus 38. Where did this money go? Let's take a look. I won't go super deep this evening, but I do want to touch on it. Exodus 38 and verse 25. Notice what the Bible says here. And the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was an hundred talents. So now you know how much was collected when the children of Israel, the men, gave according to their number, 20 years old and above. See, that's the total. And that money that they were collecting, those shekels, they were silver. What's silver represent? Continuing on. 
and a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, and a beka for every man that is, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, for every one that went to be numbered from twenty years old and upward, for six hundred thousand and three thousand and five hundred and fifty men. Too many numbers, Lord, but notice God cares enough to number everyone. He's paying attention to us too. Verse 27. And of the hundred talents of silver were cast the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets of the veil and hundred sockets of the hundred talents, a talent for a socket. And we see that the silver was taken to make the sockets for the veil and the sanctuary. They were tied to the edification of the tabernacle of the congregation. And that's referring to the holy place and the most holy place, those in the middle for those who understand how that was built. Okay. 28. And of the thousand seven hundred seventy and five shekels, he made hooks for the pillars and overlaid their chapters and filleted them. And we see the rest of the money was applied to the chapters, which were for the pillars. Now, what is all that about? Well, if we kept studying, you'd find out that the boards are tied to the tabernacle. And there's actually 20 boards in the north of this tabernacle and 20 boards in the south. Isn't that weird? What's up with all these 20s? Tied to silver, which we know the Lord was sold for pieces of silver. Yeah. That's because silver represents redemption too. Maybe we're on to something tonight here. See? But it goes even further because it's not just the tabernacle that receives this redemption, this 20, if you will. But if you were to study further and go to Exodus 27, don't go there, you'd find out that the pillars were for the actual court of the tabernacle, the outside. Okay? So what happened is if you were to build the tabernacle right now, you see that the door of the gate's on the east side. See? So you walk in from that direction. And you'd walk and you'd see the brazen altar and then the laver of brass and then the tabernacle itself. So the first thing you're to recognize is you're a sinner. You've got to look at hell. Recognize you belong there. Before you can receive the sacrifice of you know what. And then you've got to go get clean and then you can go minister and serve God. See that? But in the north and the south, what frames your Christian walk in life are these 20s. Isn't that weird? It's almost like redemption is a pillar to your life. It's almost like you need to see 2020 more than just this next year. But now I'm getting ahead of myself, am I? See that? Okay. And the funniest thing about this is if you were to study the tabernacle, you're just going to have to take my word for it. You'd find out that the tabernacle represents your soul and the court itself represents your body. And there's redemption. It's applied to both facets of your being, is it not? See, God is very particular. He's very exact. I think I know why he asked for 20 geras. See? It's because it's a ransom for your soul. Not only that, go to Numbers 14. What does 20 represent? Because if we know what it represents, we'll have some clarity on how we should be seeing 2020. Numbers 14 and verse 28, the Bible says, Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. And like, what, what's God mad about? Okay. Well, they were wandering in the wilderness for about 40 years because they did not want to follow God. It only took really 11 days for that trip. They wanted to murmur and complain every time God did it, gave them a blessing. And it got to the point where the Lord said that first generation, you're going to die in the wilderness. You from 20 years old and upward. You're the ones that need redemption, that needed to trust me, and you chose to remember against me, and they, their carcasses fell there in the wilderness. That's the wilderness of sin, spiritually speaking. But, verse 31, But your little ones, which ye uh, said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. Now that's interesting. The Lord says if you are younger than 20, you don't need a ransom. You don't need an atonement. I'm going to bring you in the land. You're going to partake of the blessing. Okay? We see that they are safe. And so those that are 20 and older, they need redemption. I didn't actually read verse 30, but you'd find that there were some, like Joshua and like Caleb, that did get to go in. So it's not automatic. It's not like they all failed. Some people received and saw 2020. See? 
And you might say, well, this is a very particular instance in the history of Israel. He's treating the whole congregation this way. Is 20 the age of accountability for us? That's a good question. Go to Romans 7. Romans 7. Because the fact is we see the importance of redemption. We see how it seemed to be necessary for a people that rejected the word of God. What about us today? In Romans 7, and go to verse 9 to give you some ideas, Paul is giving us a picture of his life. He's letting us know what happened. And this applies to every single person individually, the Bible says. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. You see, there was a point where he responded to the law that was written in his heart. The law that he was taught as a Pharisee. Us Gentiles, we have our conscience that's here. And there's a point where we recognize we do wrong and we see it and we feel guilt. That's the moment you died spiritually. That's the moment when you probably needed to start seeing 2020. Is it not? Have you seen 2020? Well, we're just getting to 2020 now, man. Oh, well, amen. Praise the Lord. It's amazing that we're at the year 2020, is it not? I'm shocked. I remember when I was, well, not my daughter's age, but a little older, I was like, I'd never get this old. <laughs> Newsflash for me, right? And yet the idea is that you can continue to grow in life just like I did. It gets to a point where you realize you need to start seeing a little more clearly. You need to get clarity on the important things of life. Like your family and how much you didn't value them. You despise them once and you figure that out. See? Or the fact that you have life and that God gave you talents. All these things you can discover as you grow and you start seeing things better and better. But that all starts with recognizing that you died once. Have you figured that out? And you might say, well, Manny, I want to know, how do you see 2020? Okay. And you know what? I get it. Because I don't want you to have any vision. I don't want you to perish. I just said that earlier. The key is to keep the law, and then you'll be happy, isn't it? See? And so, since we're looking at 2020, the first question is, for those who have foresight towards 2020, what should they be doing? Well, what are you talking about? Go to, go to Psalm 49. Here. Psalm 49. If you have foresight for 2020, that means you're listening to this message and you're considering these words and you're like, what's this redemption stuff I'd like to know? So now you're looking towards the north of that tabernacle. You're seeing the 20 boards there. You see, you're seeing those pillars filled with the silver. You're trying to recognize that redemption. Well, how do I get there? Psalm 49. I should probably get there myself. And go to verse 6. You might think, well, don't I got to do some works? Okay, well, let's, let's take a look at that. Psalm 49 and verse 6, the Bible says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, all of them by any means can redeem his brother. Is that what the Bible says? Now, this may come to a shock because I'm pretty sure many people thought that their wealth might have some value for God. That's probably why they were given. See? But many, you had mentioned that they had to give their 20 geras of silver in order to pay the ransom for the atonement of their souls. It seems like money has value. Yeah. And sure, God can take that money and turn it around and use it for his glory, but that's not the key item here. He was trying to get them to see something. Okay. And now he's expressing that progressively here in Psalm 49, because if we keep reading, let's read verse 7 properly now. None of them those who trust in their wealth, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it seetheth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. And here we find that if you're going to have foresight towards 2020, you need to recognize that it's not of works, that it's not of your wealth. See? You got to recognize that somebody needs to step in. Any examples of that? Go to Ruth 4. Ruth, little tiny book of Ruth right after Judges, chapter 4. And let's see if there's somebody that can pay the ransom. 
Because it seems like you can't pay for your own. Ruth 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Then went Boaz, and that's what we're going to look at. See? Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a woman. Turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, sell a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. Now, I bring this up because notice that a ransom needs to be paid by somebody else for you. It's the first thing you notice. And there might be somebody who's willing to pay that price because the redemption of the soul is precious and they care about your soul. And here you have Boaz dealing with the kinsman here. And he continues in verse 4 and says, and he said, I will redeem it. So it sounds like, oh, well, I'm willing to pay for this, Boaz. I'm willing to take care of this. But notice the cunning of Boaz, verse 5. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest a field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Now that's interesting. So he mentions, hey, don't forget, you got to raise up seed to Ruth for the dead. And what does this guy say? And the kinsman said, verse 6, I cannot redeem it for myself. Lest I mar mine own inheritance, redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. And there might be another person, okay, who preventure might die for you. That might happen. But guess what? That's only physical. That's got nothing to do with your soul. Do you really think they want to take your sins upon them? Do you think they're willing to deal with the reality they have to take your dead on top of you? That's not how it works. They're barely trying to deal with their own. It takes someone who can give life to handle this. Okay. Now what I like about this is that we see here that when we're dead in trespasses and sins, we can't just be redeemed by anyone. It requires somebody who's willing to pay the price and understands that it's possible that they might get stained, that they'd have to do some serious work, that they might have to roll up their hands and get dirty, so to speak, to get the job done. Well, who is that? Romans 3. Romans 3. And I probably should have read verses 9 and 10 in Ruth. You'd find out that Boaz was willing to buy the land. And because he bought the land, because he went through and paid for all that, he redeemed and took Ruth and raised seed. He was willing to pay that price. See? He didn't think that way, that it was going to stain his inheritance. He thought of what was right. Romans 3. And verse 24, Bible says, being justified freely by his grace, it's the grace of God, through the redemption that is in Christ. Jesus. You see, the greater Boaz is Jesus Christ our Lord. He was the one who was willing to roll up his hands and get into the mire and dirtiness of this present evil world and take the form of a servant in order to to pay that price to redeem you. Knowing he would have to give up his own life to pay for your sins at Calvary. And yet just like Boaz, he was willing to redeem it. And he was willing to marry you personally through the justification he provides. So if you have foresight to 2020, you should be looking at the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because, verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So you might take the time to look forward and look for Christ and try to have Christ and place your faith in Jesus Christ so that you too can start seeing 2020 more clearly. Because you'll receive the justification that gives eternal life. You'll be just like Ruth and marry your personal Boaz, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see him? 
Well, I've never considered that Jesus before. I thought I had to do things to get grace from him. Well, think about that. You have to mer you have to do things to merit unmerited favor. Does that? I I, I I know you never thought about it, but I'm trying to give you clear vision here so you can see that redemption is something that costs God his life. And he wants to offer that to you. So are you willing to receive that? Because if you see 2020 clearly, you'll want to look and live. You'll stop fighting against looking at the fiery serpent like you're supposed to, looking at that serpent of brass, if you will. You'll look with faith. And you might say, well, well, man, I'm already saved. What are you talking about? Well, guess what? Hindsight is 2022. If you notice, 2020's got two 20s. I like this year. This is pretty useful. <laughs> and just like there's two 20s in 2020, there's a north and a south on the tabernacle and in the court. You see? And yeah, your soul is filled with the Spirit of God because He dwells in your heart by faith, Christian. And yet you're surrounded on all sides. You're serving God with the reality of 2020. Especially when you look back. There's a lot of silver over there. See? Go to Romans 8. And the reason why there's silver around about you is God's reminding you that, yes, I have saved your soul, but there's more redemption to come. Remember, there's two. Oh, did you forget it, right? Romans 8, verse 23, the Bible says. We're going to skip a couple contexts here, but just read it. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Amen. You're saved. The Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. Amen. Even we ourselves grow within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Remember, when you're looking at that court, that court represents your body. God has a redemption left to come. And so, yes, hindsight is 2020. But as you look back, you recognize, wow, God's got more for me coming up in the future. I have a hope, you see? And because I have that hope, I should choose to live for God. He surrounds me from all sides and shows me I have more blessings to give you. I don't just want to live in your heart. I want to manifest through you in your life. I want people to see the flames of God and his glory rising up out of the tabernacle and causing a flame to light everyone around. And you. See? Will you let the living water run forth? You may say, who's that like? Go to Genesis 31. Genesis 31, please. We're going to go to verse 41. Here's an example of somebody who started living for God after he went through a couple trials. We're going to see the end of his trials here. Starts getting a little better, this guy. Genesis 31 and verse 41, the Bible says. It doesn't say there, but Jacob is talking. And the Bible says, Thus have I been 20 years in thy house, him talking to Laban, serving a person who is you basically using them. And guess what? The world's going to use you up, Chris. You're going to go through some trials. And here he recognizes that he's serving for 20 years once again. What's the purpose? Verse 42. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, except recognizing the 2020s around me in my life, that redemption, the fact that that God is walking with me now. See? Surely thou hast sent me away, now empty. God hath seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. God. Wrong verse. Go to verse 41 again. So I got to skip something there. Because it says there, I served thee 14 years for thy two daughters. This is what he served for. And six years for thy cattle. That's the 20. Now why do I point this out? So it's good to know that the reason why you serve and the reason why you're capable to do that is because of God, verse 42, amen? But he did that in order to redeem his own family from Laban and Gideon. Now think about your life, Christian. Think about the people around you who you influence by the choices you make to choose to serve God or not. And it looks like Jacob made that decision and recognized his fear of God and choosing to follow the God of his fathers in order to be there as an example so that his family could be redeemed out of the hands of life. What about you? You know your family's in the mire of sin. You know you live in a present evil world. 
Are you willing to live for God? Are you willing to consider 2020 and say, I want them to also see the silver that's around me? I want them to see Christ Jesus and him crucified in my life so that they can receive him too. Now he was willing to work 20 years. How long are you willing to work to see your family saved, Christian? Some of us were blessed. Our family got saved in a year, year and a half. Others, we could be praying for them for much longer than 20. So you know hindsight is 2020. It should make you to look forward and know that yes, God saved you and he can save them if I choose to live for him. If I choose to manifest that redemption to others through my testimony. And you know what the funniest thing about that is? When you choose to co-labor with God, he's got stuff for you. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. It's, it's like you, you just can't outgive God, like the pastor said this morning. 1 Corinthians 3. We'll start in verse 11 to point out a very important point. For no other foundation can no man lay than that is his laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the only redemption. He is 2020. And Christian, now you have that in hindsight because you've received him by faith. So what happened? 12, verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, would hay stubble? Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built upon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire, because you are redeemed. Why do I point this out? Yeah. Because you notice that one of those things you can receive from Jesus Christ is silver. You see? Notice he remembered, he called the men of the children of Israel and he said, I need you to give a ransom. I need you to offer something. And we saw that it was silver. Well, Christian, you're the spiritual people of God now. Are you willing to offer that silver out to others? And you know what's funny about it? You offer it, God uses it to edify somebody else's tabernacle. Maybe they get saved and it comes back and you get more silver. And it keeps happening and it repeats and the cycle continues. That's the beauty of living for God. He sets you up to make sure you're nice and rich coming in the millennium, praise God. And sure, physically rich, that's going to be real silver. I'm not going to deny that in this verse. But spiritually speaking, because you'll see the fruits of your labor around you with the people that got saved through your ministry. How about that? Instead of looking at boards and pillars anymore, now you're looking at actual people who make up the body of Christ. See? We're a living house, right? We're a spiritual priesthood. And wouldn't it be a blessing that as you look and consider 2020 that possibly somebody can get saved through your efforts? Or at the very least, the light can shine forth and the Lord can work through you in order to give them an honest testimony of the gospel of Christ in their hearts so they can make a choice. That'd be a blessing. Okay. Because yes, Harvest is plenty and laborers are few, but we're more in a Jeremiah time than an Elijah one. I'm not going to pretend. And it requires people of faith who continuously look towards 2020 to make the decision to be like Jacob and labor, even if it's only just for their family and a couple of lambs. Right? If one soul is saved, isn't that worth as much as the world? We forgot. And so to conclude, go to Psalm 130. Psalm 130, please. Psalm 130 and verse 7, the Bible says, Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And i just like to end concluding that you need to realize that you're Israel. Whether you know God or not, are you hoping in the Lord? See? If you're seeing 2020, you're recognizing that he has that plenteous redemption available to you to partake of and to minister to others. Are you willing to do that? 
And so I just pray that Bible Baptist Church, as we approach 2020, that we try to keep a visualization of it as we go through that year. Okay. Pastor, if you would close us in prayer, sir. Thank you, Father, for the blessings you've given us. We thank you that people have been saved.